So we have uh, at least six people who teach international law full time, which as far as I know is the largest uh, number of faculty teaching international law almost full time uh, at any institution. Even a place like Georgetown or Harvard, which has a larger faculty, as far as I count, do not have uh, more international law faculty. So uh, I'll just tell you a little bit about each of them and, uh, and some of the courses they teach. So uh, Professor Dina Hurwitz teaches a lot of human rights courses. She teaches a, a, a human rights clinic. She teaches a course about the substantive law of human rights. And she uh, supervises the Human Rights Study Project, which is a student-driven project that Diane has participated in and will perhaps discuss. Professor uh, Martin has been the general counsel of the Immigration and Naturalization Service and most recently was uh, one of the deputy general counsels of the Department of Homeland Security. He's also had a long and fruitful career in academia. He tends to concentrate on human rights law and on immigration law, which some people count as international law because it involves flows of people across borders. Uh, he's also taught the international law survey course. Professor Moore uh, uh, heads the Center for Oceans Law as well as the Center for National Security. He, uh, he teaches not only oceans law but national security law, which is, which is typically domestic law and international law oriented especially towards matters of national security. So that might be immigration law if you're talking about trying to catch terrorists at the border. It might be uh, laws about electronic surveillance. It might be international law about the United Nations and so forth. He uh, also teaches the international law survey course. He teaches a series of seminars on uh, various conflicts such as Vietnam and he teaches uh, a number of courses about the interaction between political theories and international law theories of war and peace chiefly. I'm Professor Satir. Uh, I teach the international law survey course. I'm doing that right now. Uh, I also teach a number of historically oriented seminars about constitutional law and international law, uh, chiefly in U.S. history. So uh, right now I'm teaching a course about the interwar period, the period between World War I and World War II, and we look at some constitutional law issues, whether Franklin Roosevelt exceeded his constitutional authority in making a so-called destroyers for bases deal, for example, and we look at international law, such as the Treaty of Versailles or the Munich Agreement and so forth. Professor Stephen, um, has taught the international law survey course. He's especially interested in private international law, so he teaches courses in international taxation. He's taught courses uh, on the European Union. We typically, for the courses on the European Union, have uh, instructors from EU countries, usually Germany, come here and offer uh, what are called short courses. I don't know if you've heard too much about the short courses, but these tend to be courses that are two weeks long that meet intensively during the semester. It's a way that we can get people here who couldn't ordinarily uh, spend a whole semester here. So typically our coverage of the EU is uh, handled either by Professor Stephen or by uh, a series of Germans. Pierre Verdier is uh, not only someone who teaches international law but is himself a representative of the globalization of law. He's a Canadian citizen, French Canadian citizen. He has taught the international law survey course. He also is especially interested in private international law, business to business international law. He teaches a course on international financial institutions. He teaches, uh, he's teaching right now a seminar uh, which is more academically oriented on international law and theories of politics that govern international relations. And those are the six people who teach international law more or less full time. We have some other faculty members who uh, repeatedly teach international law oriented courses. So uh, A.E. Dick Howard teaches a course on comparative constitutionalism. He has, as he will also tell you, assisted in the writing of a number of constitutions of various countries. And um, Steve Walt is a professor who's typically oriented towards bankruptcy and other uh, U.S. law, but he also teaches a course on international sales. There is no so that those are the six folks, plus some others, who tend to teach international law courses. There is no certificate in international law or formal specialization in international law here. Um, there's really no 
It's rare for one international law course to have another course as a prerequisite, which gives you a lot of flexibility. So it's not as if you have to take course A and course B in order to take the upper level courses. If you're going to take international taxation, you usually need to have taken the basic federal income taxation course. But uh, otherwise, the courses tend to, uh, to have no prerequisites. So it's kind of a, a broad curriculum in that sense. So public international law involves government-to-government -government relationships, things like treaties or the United Nations along those lines. Private international law typically involves a corporation-to-corporation -corporation relations across national borders. Uh, in the world at large, public international law in terms of employment is very much a niche. So the people who go into public international law from here Every few years, we might have someone who goes to the State Department. And the State Department hires so few people each year that our experience is fairly typical. There are people who, there are other jobs at the Department of the Treasury or at the Department of Justice that involve an international aspect. So we have had students who, either over the summer or as full time employment, have worked on tracking down war criminals or on uh, uh, international litigation in which the government is involved. But the vast bulk of people here and elsewhere who go into international law, go into private international law by working for a large corporate-oriented law firm that has either international clients or domestic clients with international operations. Uh, and uh, you know, on that front, I guess I'd say the advantages that UVA has uh, are twofold. They may be related. One is a lot of students come here interested in international law. So I would say, let's see, so I have 100 students in my international law survey course, and uh, about another 50 took international law in the fall. So that's roughly almost half the class. So almost half the class takes the international law introductory course. So you do have a lot of people who are interested in international law, and that means that the J.B. Moore Society has a lot of members. That means Vigil is the, after the conventional law review, Vigil is the second most prestigious student-run journal here, and so that, that has a lot of, uh, of implications. The other thing is it means that out in the world at large, there are lots and lots of UVA alums who are working at large corporate firms on an internationally oriented practice. So when they come here for the on-grounds interviews, the, the law firms are almost always sending UVA alums, which I think is helpful because they understand how the school works and they, of course, like people who are like them. And, through the years, people at UVA have a certain similarity to one another, so I think that's a big advantage. 